Hello friends. Welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk with you about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Until now I had had little opportunity to visit the troops on the immediate front line. Today, on the December 19th, I wanted to visit the ones I had missed and see for myself how it really was out there. Watch out that you don't end up with the enemy, said Paulus as I reported to him on my departure. I have entered the whole of the front on my map from the latest reports, General. My aim is to visit the 44th and the 76th Infantry Divisions. We started off at about 9 am, I did not know the driver, he had been commandeered from a division by our staff. On the way via Gonkara to Rasashka I witnessed the shattering scenes that were played out every day at the dressing stations, sick bays and in the field hospitals. I got out in front of a hospital, in September I visited a main dressing station near Gumrak, where the impression had dug deep into my consciousness. But what I saw in this hospital today was even more shocking, absolutely dreadful, ghastly. Half debilitated orderlies were taking the badly injured out of the many waiting vehicles around and taking them on stretchers to medical tents. There they lay on some bloody, dirty blankets until there was room for them on the operating table. The room was in a house about 15 meters long on whose entrance hung a red cross flag. In order to get in I had to push my way through a number of lightly wounded, all wanting treatment. One of them begged me, help us, colonel, we have been here three days without any attention. Most of us have frozen hands and feet, forward of here all the collecting points and dressing stations are full. The doctors sent us here. Out of a dirty, stubbled, staring face blinked a pair of tired, feverish eyes. The hands of the soldier were bound with strips of a woolen blanket. I told him that I had come to speak to the doctors, then I turned back into the building. Through an open door I was able to look into a room full of wounded. These were tended cases waiting for transport, a shivering collection of white bandages and dirty uniforms, laid closely together in rows on the ground, more or less covered in greatcoats or scraps of cloth. In the adjacent room was the operating theater. As I appeared in the doorway, a man rushed towards me from those standing around the operating table. It was a doctor. Hollow-eyed, pale, tormented, he stood in a blood-soaked smock and smeared apron. For three weeks now we three doctors and twenty medical orderlies have been working day and night. Once, when a bomb ripped off half the roof, about thirty wounded and nine of our people were killed. Another time the Russian artillery had similar success with two hits. Now we cannot move anymore because all our vehicles are out of action. We are completely full, of course we help all the newcomers. We give them a plate of hot soup or a cup of tea, change their dressings and send the vehicles on to the city. Emergency hospitals have been set up there in the remaining buildings and cellars of the ruins, where these poor chaps at least have a protective roof over their heads. What do you do with the severely wounded doctor? We send them on by divisional ambulances to Potomac Airfield. The army surgeon arranges their flights out of the cauldron, Colonel. With our capacity here there is nothing much we can do about healing. It is a misery, if you drive on you will unfortunately see much worse than here. And so it was, on the road were stopped vehicles fully loaded with the wounded. But their wounds did not bother them anymore, they were, literally, frozen. The vehicle's fuel tanks were empty. Until the driver, usually the only one capable of driving, returned with his fuel canister after hours of seeking and begging, such misfortune was inevitable. The fierce cold extinguishing the little life left in the weakened bodies. Nobody was looking after this dead freight, usually they were mercifully covered in a white blanket of snow. The light wounded and sick gathered everywhere where there were buildings, tents or dugouts. In small groups, they trailed tiredly along by foot to the city. A few had the rare luck to get a ride on one of the vehicles that were still moving. During the heavy fighting of the summer and autumn the city had been avoided by everyone who was not ordered to go into it, now it was like a magnet that drew everyone. There they hoped to find shelter in a cellar, assistance from a medical unit and perhaps even a plate of soup. Napoleon's beaten army must have looked similar when it withdrew to the west wrapped in blankets and bits of tent, with sacks and bandages on their frozen feet instead of boots. They were hardly soldiers anymore. They were a broken, disarmed mob. If they were to be saved, immediate medical help, food and warm accommodation had to be ready for them. 
Every day's delay meant that it was too late for many. The adjutant of the 76th Infantry Division complemented my own impressions with a detailed report on the personnel situation. The casualties, especially sick and completely exhausted people, have been catastrophic for several days. The gaps among the infantry are ever larger. Those reporting sick are mainly too late, so there is nothing that can be done for them. How can that be explained, until now we have taken immediate countermeasures. Many soldiers report themselves sick for the slightest reasons, just sick enough to get out of the combat zone for a few days, I interjected. That's right, Colonel, but it is different here, not a few shy off from reporting sick because they fear being left behind in a fighting retreat. I think that most of the infantrymen not in the front line are sick. What is the mood among the troops? That is hard to say, Colonel, they were depressed when the cauldron was closed. When it became known that Hoth had started a relieving attack, it raised their courage and hope. We believed that the encirclement would be quickly broken. Since then eight days have passed and there is understandably deep disappointment. There are individual voices harshly criticizing the high command, Hitler, the Nazi party and the whole war. Even some officers do not understand the sense of this sacrificial holding on and the long wasting away of our army. But until now the 76th Infantry Division has shown steadfastness in every situation, I interrupted the divisional adjutant. The symptoms you have described contrast with the behavior of the troops in battle. That is so, Colonel, when the enemy attacks, those who were cursing the Hitler only a few minutes before pick up their weapons. They fight sometimes because they have a panicking fear about captivity, at other times because they are waiting for Hoth to open up the cauldron. How far has Colonel General Hoth got towards the enclosing ring? From what I heard before coming to see you, the relieving army is engaged in strong attacks by the enemy. They are only slowly gaining ground, but we hope that they will be advancing again in a few days. On my journey onto the 44th Infantry Division one witnessed the same terrible scenes. I soon had the vehicle full of wounded. Mouths and eyes peered out of the blood-soaked bandages. The second one had his shot through arm in a sling. I had taken in the third because he was staggering all over the road so that one feared at any moment he would fall and never get up again. Full of fever, he sat between the other two wounded on the back seat of my jeep. Where shall I drop you off, comrade? I asked the one with the injured arm. When it is possible for you, he saw my badges of rank, colonel, at a hospital where we can be taken in. We will try in Gumrack, there is a proper hospital there. We will see if we can take another two comrades. My driver threw a disapproving look at me when I took in two more soldiers with head injuries who were looking for help on the side of the road. They sat on the rear of the back seat. As it was already quite late, I abandoned the intended visit to the 44th Infantry Division once I had got enough of an impression. I told the driver to turn eastwards, after a long journey, going past army headquarters, we eventually reached Gumrack. Although this hospital was already over full, I was able to hand over my five passengers. I reached headquarters later than intended and reported my return to Paulus. There was still no order to break out. Headquarters Army Group Don said the Commander-in-Chief is keeping quiet. The only reply I have received to my questions ran, wait, implement Operation Thunderclap only on explicit orders. How long is this going to go on, General? The adjutant of the 76th Infantry Division reported to me today that the gaps in the infantry will soon be so big that the front will no longer be able to be manned throughout. The Corps has received orders to extract companies from the city front and give them to the divisions of the western and southern fronts. Have a look at the allocation plan at Elchlep. Apart from that we have decided to remove soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers from staff, rear services, panzer regiments and artillery battalions. We are calling them fortress battalions, the various regiments have released their third battalions, there are enough battle experienced commanders there. Give me proposals for the personnel appointments. Has someone been made responsible for the setting up of these fortress battalions, General? Not yet, Adam. Who do you suggest? I am thinking of the commander of the 14th Panzer Division, Colonel Latman. He has a capable staff. His division exists only as small combat teams that are individually deployed. Good, agreed. Latman has the makings for this role. 
Schmidt too values him and will say nothing against this proposal. In fact Schmidt immediately approved when I took the matter to him. Yes, indeed, Latman is the right man for these emergency units. Will he too be delighted, General? From what I know of the mood of the troops, there is no great desire among either the officers or the soldiers to play a role in such a thrown-together fire brigade. If it goes as it is, we won't need Latman. He will soon come to order, said the chief of staff laconically. I was not happy about the business. Fortress battalions really nonsense, when one thought how many of these soldiers had no experience of infantry combat. Most of them had been vegetating until now near the stoves in some bunker or other. Now they were being chased out into the icy cold and raging storms. Would they really be of any assistance in the hard fighting on the front? Back in my bunker I went through the courier post. It consisted of the usual, promotions from the ranks for bravery before the enemy, awards of knights crosses and German crosses in gold. The army personnel office gave notice of a consignment of decorations, iron crosses first and second class as well as appropriate clasps, knights crosses and German crosses. In addition, almost unbelievably, there were two cases of Croatian medals, when we had only one Croatian artillery regiment in the cauldron, under the 100th Jaeger Division. This regiment was at the same time already being taken care of with the same medal in generous quantities, so that it had no further requirements. Already the next day the medals arrived by courier aircraft. It needed four soldiers to move the vast container into a workroom. The boxes took up so much space that I could hardly turn around in the room. Senior Sergeant Major Cupper opened them with a hatchet. They were filled to the brim with Croatian war medals. It would be best, Colonel, if we send the boxes as they are to the 100th Jaeger Division, said Cupper. That makes no sense, they don't rightly know what they should do with them. I will talk to General Paulus about it. At supper I talked about the awards that had been bestowed on the army. My description brought general laughter, but also anger that valuable cargo space had not been used for foodstuffs. I can give you further hair-raising examples, said the senior quartermaster. With the last machines came a dozen cases of prophylactics, three tons of sweets, four tons of marjoram and pepper, and 200,000 knapsacks of Wehrmacht propaganda. I therefore wish the bureaucrats responsible only had eight days of experience in the cauldron then they would no longer do such imbecilic things. I wonder too that Colonel Batter has not prevented this when we have sent out so many requests for this purpose. I immediately protested energetically to Army Group Don and begged that in future the persons responsible at the dispatching airfields are better instructed and supervised. That is good, Konoski, intervened Paulus. I will also ask Manstein to ensure that such misdemeanors cease in future. Batter seems to me no longer to have any influence on our supplies. We should transfer suitable officers to take command at the dispatching airfields who have their own experience of our situation. I ask you, Schmidt and Konoski, to check over the problem and make me proposals. The following days passed without the awaited codeword thunderclap from Manstein. Paulus and Schmidt spoke daily on the decimeter apparatus with the army group. As on previous days, I listened to and recorded in shorthand most of the conversations that Paulus had. As before, Manstein put aside all questions about the situation outside the cauldron. On the December 22nd connection with the outside world was lost when the decimeter apparatus fell silent. Our troops on the lower chur must have been wiped out. So went our days, days of useless discussions and inactive perseverance. The 6th Army headquarters waited for the redeeming orders from above. Meanwhile fell, froze and hungered ever more thousands of soldiers, their vitality becoming ever weaker with this delay. Paulus and his staff saw that the main reason for the growing catastrophe lay in the stubbornness and lack of care shown by Hitler and the superior headquarters. Doubtless they bore a considerable part of the blame. But did this not prove that our army headquarters, by dutifully holding out, was nothing but a well-functioning cog in the whole people-killing machine? Was it not thus also guilty? We were a product of Prussian military training, accustomed to obeying orders in ourselves then passing on a given order even if it made no sense, was murderous, barbaric towards our own troops. Above all, we were not educated in critical political thinking. We thus thought at that time that the catastrophe of Stalingrad was essentially a result of decisive military errors by the high command. 
That the Second World War started by Hitler's Germany was a crime not only against the peoples attacked by us, but also against the German nation, did not occur to us. And because of this, we did not recognize the deeper reasons for the defeat on the Volga, which lay not in individual strategic or tactical errors, but in the superiority of the socialist state and social system, whose sharp sword was the Soviet army. We wondered about the strength and bravery of the Soviet soldiers in front of and within Stalingrad, and were astonished at the precision with which the Soviet operations were conducted, but we did not understand what drove them.